Uh, next speaker, of course, again, like pretty much everyone at Handmade Con needs our introduction, uh, but uh, it's kind of a unique, uh, a bit of a unique perspective, which is that uh, the, the games uh, that John's worked on have obviously been ones where there's quite a bit of like design and programming kind of coming together, so it's, they're, they're, it's sort of, a, a, I think, perhaps a little bit of a different perspective than people who work uh, strictly on technology, such as myself, uh, who don't sort of think about the design, don't sort of think about those things. But on Handmade Hero, obviously, we always try to focus on the programming part uh, of programming. But uh, even though we don't ever really get into that design stuff, if you are going to be someone who works on programming and who works on these sorts of things in the game industry, it's something that you really have to be aware of. Because like a big part of whether the design works or a big part of whether it goes well is whether or not that whole sort of like overlay of programming and design works well and, and, and does that sort of thing. So uh, the thing that I really wanted to talk to John about was kind of that, that sphere of what does it mean you know, to have like the, the technology and the programming sort of like complement design, and how does that process work, all those sorts of things. And I couldn't think of anyone better to talk about it because, uh, well, he's one of the best programmers I know, and he's one of the best designers I know. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, please give a, a warm welcome to Mr. Jonathan Blow. <laughs> Oh, are you on? Uh, we got to unmute you. There's just a little switch on the top, I think. Uh, I saw, there you uh, go. I saw the red light. Yeah, it's, it's that deceptive. That it's deceptive. There's been a shortage of chocolate eating, is what I'm getting at. So yes. I've got all of this to myself, except for whatever I leave for Ron at the end. So. Which is up to you, I guess, right? Yeah. You, you could decide to leave with nothing if we'll you want. We'll find out. It's the precedence. I should have put some aside. All right. So. Uh, so First of all, let me say thank you for taking time out of your schedule to come to this at this time, because well, the witness is like a month away or Andy's something. Andy's here too, so. And Andy's here, so we, we have if like. If the game's late, yeah. it's both of our fault. <laughs> uh, but thank you so much for coming. Uh, I sort of, I, I guess like. I hope this isn't that loud, actually, but. I wouldn't worry about it. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's part of the. Uh, it's a fireside chat. Yeah, it's a fireside chat. It's meant to be intimate. <laughs> And if you get the mic right up to like get the little like squishy sounds and the yeah. you you say that like it's funny, but I was doing temp voice at various times for over a month, month and a half. Okay. And when you're recording stuff straight into a mic in a little room and listening to it, it's really kind of disgusting, actually. <laughs> like when you're really paying attention to it professionally. So yeah. All right. Well, All right. you can choose to be as disgusting as you want. That's right. that's up to you. That is my policy. So let me start out by, uh, well, actually, let me start out by actually getting the, uh, the mischief window back up here if we can. Yeah. There we go. So in case you want to draw. Uh, let me start out by saying, so what I kind of wanted to talk about, and it's going to be a little hard for me because like I was saying beforehand, like I have worked with you before and I kind of know a bunch of stuff about the way you like to approach things and that sort of stuff. So I'm going to try as best I can to pretend to forget all that so that I won't leave things out when I'm asking questions. But I apologize if I, if I can't do it. Uh, I'm going to do my best. But what I wanted to kind of talk about is like if, if you look at sort of uh, the game that you're working on now and the game that you did beforehand. So if we look at Braid and The Witness, one of the things that I think is kind of really remarkable about those projects is that unlike most games that I see, the degree to which the programming is customized to the design is like dramatic. Like there are games where there's just a tremendous amount of actual code that seems to go into the design, if that makes sense. I don't know if you would agree with that or not, but that's kind of like, as an external person, it's not like, oh, we made a little thing that allows you to swap the gems, and then we just made a little leveler that you place the gems in and whatever, and like off it goes. It's, it didn't look like that. So kind of what I wanted to start off talking about is, how do you look at you know, development these days? Because you do a lot of the programming. You, did, you do a ton of the programming on The Witness. You did a ton of programming on, on uh, Braid, almost all of the programming on Braid. How do you look at development coming from it from that perspective of, I am both the main person who is thinking about how this game works as a game, but also I'm the person who's doing all of the code for it. Like, just what yeah. does that feel mm. like when you sit down? What are you thinking? How does that go? There's, a, there's an analogy in design, in the situation with design and running a team trying to get the game done, right? Because even yeah. Braid was a small, it was, you know, me with... There was a few people, yeah. People helping out. It wasn't all me doing everything, right? Um, but there's an analogy to what Mike was talking about, at least during the object-oriented or data-oriented design 
talk and possibly a little bit today, um, which is just right. You have a you have a problem, right? And the correct mindset. He was saying this about the Meat Boy thing. The correct mindset is to do what is required to solve the problem, right? And that abstractions that come in are really only useful to the extent that they help you solve that problem in the most efficient, expedient, whatever way, right? So to begin with, right, the barrier between design and programming is only an abstraction, right? Okay. First of all. Uh, it, it has, there are certain contours that that sort of tends to conform to in reality because if you can type code and make it work versus can't, that's a... The hard, the hard That's edge. something in reality, yeah. right? But, but um, that's not really a thing that determines disciplines unless we decide that it does, okay. right? So what is the problem, right? I just said all this is determined by what, solving the problem. The problem is I want to make a certain game, mm -hmm. right? And when I start a, a, a game, I don't even know what the final design is, right? It's okay. there's some idea and a direction to go to pursue the idea and a metric, and the metric is the important part, okay. of how good does this have to be for me to want to ship this, okay. right, and not have wasted my time. And fortunately, with the stuff I've worked on so far, it becomes apparent early on that we're going to hit that, okay. and then it just becomes a ton of work to hit it, right? Okay. Um, now, how do you hit it, right? So if the problem is we want a certain game that's at a certain level of quality, and it's not just about quality as some abstract scalar, but like there's an idea behind the game, that we want to do justice to, right? So in Braid, there was some stuff about time. Uh, and if we didn't explore that much about time, it wouldn't have been that interesting of a game, even if it had like cool platformer physics or something, right? Okay. It wouldn't have, it would have failed to be about what it was trying to be about. Right. So there's a, there's a precision idea where there's, there's something that you're trying to machine, right? Like if you have a lathe, you're trying to get all the curves exact, right? So the machinery has to be sufficient to make those curves right. Yes. And so whatever, whatever makes that machinery work well and efficiently is the right thing to do, to the most part. There's a bunch of orthogonal human factors, like okay. do the people who work with you hate you and want to kill you okay. or whatever. <laughs> um, but but if, you only, if your only time horizon is the, when, the day the game ships, yeah. right, you can simplify all that. Um, and so when you're sort of uh, describing it in that, in that way, you're sort of saying that the metric is sort of this, uh, that's, that's the, the game design, I, I guess, what you're choosing to... Okay, the whole point, I just realized, I f failed to get to the actual point of why I was saying all that stuff. <laughs> so your, t your team or whoever is working on the game is this tool, right? And, and the point that I was trying to get to is when someone designs and programs, they are inherently much, much more accurate of like a tool tip for the lathe okay. than someone designing, talking to someone who programs. Okay. You have communications barriers, okay. right? You have the fundamental communications barriers between any two people, but then also you have two people who think very differently about problems. Right, right? Okay. that's because they're um, different disciplines. And you have people with different goals because everyone has different goals. Now I've, I've been, so if you're a designer, right, and you tell a programmer, do this and that and that and that, right, it starts to become um, a little bit of a resentful situation because it, is the designer the programmer's boss? Like, why right. should that be, man? I, I went to school and learned all this stuff and I, I work really hard and this guy just says ideas of what to do and they're <laughs> stupid, like half of them aren't gonna work, right? <laughs> it's a fundamentally, um, it's, it's a little bit of a, a, a messed up way to set things up and yet that is assumed by default to be the way that you should set them up, right? And I've been the passive aggressive programmer on the other side, which, <laughs> um, where it's like, oh, the, the instruction is to, and you guys all know what I'm talking about, by the way, right? <laughs> where it's like, okay, program this. And I'm like, I'm gonna make it a little different than that, right? <laughs> and, then, and then you have an argument with the other person about why it's not exactly what they said, and maybe sometimes you make up a reason why it has to be the way that you want it to be, <laughs> right? This is just human nature. Yeah. But, but then if you're at the, um, if you're in charge of the whole thing and trying to make it come out accurately, that's going to be maybe a little messed up because it, in my position as a passive aggressive programmer who is doing the thing that I believe was most interesting or best, that's inherently a different idea than the idea for the whole game, which was not my idea to, you know? Yeah. And so there's, 
At the same time, though, you have to make a framework for people to, to have creativity and good. Like, if you don't let the programmer make any decisions, he's going to be very unhappy and do terrible work. And yeah. whatever. So you just have to make sure that um, everybody can make decisions and be creative and do the best work and have this arc where they're getting better at everything they do. But also, it has to all come together with great accuracy or precision. People get pedantic about accuracy versus precision. <laughs> Every time I read that, I still never remember which is which. So it's, it's, it seems funny. understood in this context. Yes. I feel like. So uh, talking about that specifically, though, you still do a tremendous amount of the game play programming yeah. on, say, The Witness, even though yeah. there are several programmers who work on that project. You, you actually still do a ton of that. And yeah. you think that is an essential part of, of the act of designing the game? For the way that I design it is, right? Yeah. Because, um, because I don't decide on day one or year one, like here's the whole game, yeah. here's the design document, and now right. our job is to go paragraph by paragraph through the design document and make it happen, right? And that's a straw man because nobody really does that anymore. Okay. But, you know, there's some interpolation knob you can dial from like extreme waterfall, everything's decided in advance, space shuttle or whatever, and you just have to fill it in, and like, we're just winging it every day, right? <laughs> and neither one of those is very successful for game development, right? Okay. You have to be somewhere in the middle. Um, but I am a big believer. So, so what interests me about design is that uh, I'm discovering something, right? I have an idea about what I want to explore in designing the game. And sometimes it sounds really stupid and it's hard to communicate. Like, why do, why do I want to make a game about tracing some panels with right. like a line? Right. That sounds completely stupid. Right. There's actually a very deep idea, and you know because you've played the game, right? Yes. It's actually very interesting yes. what happens. Spoiler um, warning. <laughs> spoiler, I'm not going to spoil the game <laughs> two months before it comes out. Uh, but, um, you know, so there's, there's something there that's being unrolled or unraveled. You have to find it. And at the beginning, I have the idea of what it is. And my idea of what it is is not even what the idea of what it is will be by the end time we get to the end. Right. It's a starting point, right? So it's sort of So like, you have to be able to iterate. It's like an iterative, an actual iterative solver. It's like we have to seed it with an initial guess. Yeah. But we know that that initial guess is not actually the answer. So we're going to have to go through some process to yep. try and actually now find where the answer is. And like, like any iteration process, um, the speed of iteration matters and the accuracy of iteration matters. So if you want to get to somewhere very refined, you had better be able to iterate quickly, and you had be better be able to understand the results of your iteration to a deep degree. And when that's all in one person's head, it works a lot better, okay. right? Because I don't have to communicate the results to myself. I just look and I know, right? Like, when I, when, you know, if I program some interaction and I go play it and I just know, that's like at least a week and a half of coordination and okay. correspondence between multiple people to so get like, that same result. You and have the result really that curious, they get. Give, give an example of why that blows out to weak people who don't know you. You're talking about sort of like the concept of I have to tell someone I wanted to do, then it's not going to be quite like what I wanted, or is that like, like yeah, expand that I, out a little bit? Any one of those steps is fractal, right? Like okay. I'm, I'm going to tell someone what I want to do, yeah. right? Step one is impossible, <laughs> <Yeah>. actually, right? <laughs> unless you're doing something very rote, like unless you're cloning somebody else's game like your Zynga okay. or somebody, and you're just like, we're going to change the, <laughs> the way the farmer looks. Right. Um, Instead of gems, we want fruit this time, guys. Yes. Um, you know, uh, trying to make some arty games, which means that, uh, and not, you know, pretentious art, where I can write down what the theme is. Like, right. the theme is don't throw a stone if you live in a glass house. Right, okay. Right? Okay. But the theme is something that I barely have traction on, because that's what's interesting to me, right? Okay. If it's like, if the theme is don't buy a bad piece of computing hardware that you, yes. I don't know, some, some topics are simpler than others, right? Yes. And if, if you're artistically driven, you're probably going toward nuanced topics. Okay. And those are the things that if you could communicate it without making a game, you wouldn't make the game because okay. you could just write an essay. Okay. Or I could record myself talking on YouTube for 10 minutes and okay. I wouldn't have to spend six years making a thing where you trace panels, <laughs> right? It's a much more efficient way of communication. It's true. So step one, designer explains to programmer what needs to happen is actually not possible, okay. right? Which is then why these feedback loops get really snarled, which is all, there, there's some things that 
look extremely irrational sometimes that actually are um, a result of that process being not possible. Like, oh, the designer was saying do this and do that and do that, and then one day they just turned around and all that stuff that we worked on, they just threw it out the window. It obviously wasn't that important, right? Yeah, yeah. And what it really is is uh, sometimes things are just uh, very intangible, right? And you're, you're trying to get a certain feeling or a certain sense and the way we do, even in my own head, I might try one tack and, oh, that's not really doing what I want, so let's go over here, right? And when you externalize that into multiple people, it starts to become more wasteful of a process, which at some point then these external, like, lack of resources, lack of time, yeah. limits that process and uh, limits where you can get to in the end and how well you can get there and how many people you piss off on the way and who quits your team, right? <laughs> or who quits the game industry completely. Uh, so. It's, it's a very complex thing, and just like, with, just like with strictly programming, the fewer people that you have working on a program, the better it's going to come out, because there's just not as many problems. Yeah. It's, it's the same with same a multidisciplinary idea. situation. So I guess taking a look at that and mapping it kind of onto the programming part of that too, like because you know you have to do this iteration, right? And you're looking for this idea, you're like, I, I have sort of a, a search space in mind, I have these things I want to explore, and as I explore, I'm gonna come up with new things I want to explore and so on. It just implies also, just at the coding level, that there's going to have to be a tremendous amount of flexibility uh, in whatever you make, meaning you can't sit down and just know that I'm making, you know, it can't be Wolfenstein 3D or something where it's like, I know that it's this thing and we're gonna make this rendering engine and it's this, we, we basically are making sort of like a, a clockwork kind of a thing, right? Yeah. It's kind of gotta be this, uh, this understanding at the very outset, I would say, that the way that the code is going to be written has to be designed for a lots and lots of fungibility. Would that be a correct statement? Yeah. So tell me a little bit about your perspective towards that, and uh, it, has it changed over the years? It, it hasn't from... really changed. Um, I okay. mean, I, and so what I'm going to say here about how to program this stuff is not even, um, you know, so, so on the team working on The Witness right now, there are, I'm not, I cannot be counted as a full-time programmer. I may be like a third yeah. to a half a time at this point because I'm doing all this content stuff and whatever, yeah. but then there's three full-time programmers uh, on the team. Um, so what I'm gonna say is my opinion, which I communicate to people, but the way the team works is I just let people do what they want because uh, it's still small enough that that can happen. Right? Okay. Um, but the, the way that I work is I type the absolute simplest thing that will go in the right direction at okay. any given time unless, uh, unless I detect while I'm typing it, as often happens, like, oh, this isn't really right. You know, delete it, change, right? But, um, like, the, the, the way, I, I've, I've talked to you about this before, I think, um, you know, I'll, I'll write something like, okay, I, uh, I'm trying to think of an example that, this is not a good example, but okay. I'm gonna write something that just handles the line tracing, okay. uh, and it needs to be efficient. There's almost nothing you could do that would be inefficient, which is why it's not a good example, because computers are fast, but, yeah. You know, I've got to do something that manages the data structures of like, what are you doing on this panel? And, yeah. you know, because when the, when the line is going to cross over itself, that's a very simple collision detection problem, but right. you have to do it. Yeah, right? it, has to, it has to be and, written. And you may decide two weeks later, because it's early in development, that that wasn't really the kind of interaction you even mm -hmm. wanted, right? So you don't want to spend a lot of time on this thing. Um, so you just write the absolute simplest thing and usually what that involves is ignoring everything you learned in school about how to program well, okay. right? Because most of what we learn about how to program well is, um, is uh, like insurance policies against bad things that will happen way later. Yes, yeah, some other time by and, some other person. And a, a lot of the time, of course, those things will never happen. Yes. So that's, in those cases, it's wasted work. But even when they will happen, even when I know, I'm going to need to replace this thing probably a year from now. I don't care. Okay. Because a year from now, I'm gonna have a better idea of what it needs to be anyway, right? So today, I'm just gonna make the simplest thing that I don't have to think that much about. It's kinda crappy. It's not gonna scale that well. 
but it is going to let me, it is going to be very modifiable. That's the okay. other aspect, right? Right. So the more you optimize something, the less you can modify it. Yes. Because optimization, you know, you have a very general thing, which is like code that, you know, um, where performance is not a deliverable of the code, right. right? Just functionality. And then the more performance is a deliverable, that's not really a thing, right? It's performance on specific hardware is a deliverable. So then you have all these tendrils about how does the code interact with the hardware. Yeah. And the more you optimize, the more you just squish this Play-Doh of the program onto the contour yeah. of the hardware yeah. till it's like 100% of it yes. is all determined by your CPU architecture yes. or whatever, right? Yeah. Um, you don't want to go that far in that direction if you know you're just going to replace something later, yeah. right? Um, now, the reason all this works uh, is because it's not like we're delivering a game on a blistering time scale. Like, if you right. only have time to type something yeah. once and deliver it, then you can't do this. But if your concern is, I'm trying to make the, the best design, right, then I'll program it five times if I need to. to. I, this is an attitude, it's very different today. But when I got into games, um, you know, I, I started my first game company with a friend, the absolute worst time to start a game company, right? Yeah. It was January 1996. Yep. Q-Test came out like February something, 1996, yeah. if you guys remember that. Yeah. We were just figuring out how to do 3D. Yep. It was all software rendered. Yep. You, you know, a, like a handful of people in the world knew how to do this efficiently. Yes. And you decided and, to do a network game. Yeah, networked, multiplayer, server, yeah. client server, drop in, drop out, it was amazing. Yeah. Um, nobody played it. Uh, I tried to find a screenshot from that game, yeah. by the way, and failed. R I could not find it. Okay. There's like one that's like the sequel to it or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was sort of know. one game that we kept evolving. Yeah, it was so confusing. It, but anyway, continue. Anyway, um, what was I talking about? Well, I, <laughs> you got I was me. asking you about sort of the degree of flexibility you need in the code, and you were talking about why, well, you were talking about why it's possible to do it the way that you're doing it, because it's not in a short time scale. And then you said there's an attitude, we didn't quite get to the attitude, that was different oh, right. then yeah. than it is now. So back then, you know, I, I started as a programmer with some ideas about design, right? So I, on this first game, I was writing the 3D pipeline, right? I was writing the texture mapper where you're trying to be perspective correct and, and do the fixed point map yep. and all that good yeah. stuff, right? And computers were changing fast enough that four months later, literally, at, at the height of it, four months later, your design decisions would have been different. Right, because, because you the, know, the architecture would change uh, enough. Like a 48666, and then like a Pentium something, yeah. right? It's just like, what? Yep. Uh, and you didn't understand 3D that well. Right. So, uh, you know, one of the reasons this game wasn't that good is because we spent so much time programming it. Um, yeah. But that's because what you had to do, um, you had to do that in those days to have something that runs fast. You know, I mean, the story about, how much iteration Carmack and Abrash did on Quake. It's yeah. just like they did a zillion things, yeah. right? And that's what we did in those days, because that's what you had to do. And now the attitude is different, because um, there's this natural thing of like, oh, I programmed this. It just, I just got it to work. It's so precious. I'm going to put it over here. Okay. And it's done, and we're never going to, you know. Okay. And it's, in, in the 90s, it was like, no. The day you finish it is the day you start rewriting it, right? Okay. By the time you get to version 7 of your texture yeah. mapper, maybe it's okay, right? Okay. Um, That's kind of the same sort of a process, too, as with the design process you're talking about, where it's like, yeah. it's a, more of a search process, where it's like, we don't really know exactly what we're building here, and the only way to gather enough information to know what we are supposed to build is to build something sort of like it first and yes. see what happens, right? Yeah, you gotta, you gotta jump in the pond before you can find things in the pond, I guess, right? Or something. That's not exactly a Exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> yes. It's a murky pond, so you can't really see. You gotta grope around yeah. in there. It's fish get in the way. Yeah, they lots bite of you. big fish in the pond. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, so moving back to, I guess, sort of the, the original part about yeah. structuring the code for that flexibility, right? Yeah. So when you sit down and you're going to do the absolute simplest thing possible, right? Yeah. Which I've heard you say before as well, as like kind of just a general good mindset to be in, which I totally agree with is, you know, I, I don't want to overcomplicate this thing, and so probably my first intuition, especially if you've been programming for a while, your first intuition on how to write it is probably good enough for that first pass, and if you try to overthink it at that time, you don't have enough information to make a better decision anyway. So in general, that does seem like a good mindset, but I do feel like on a lot of projects, right, 
that doing that too exclusively ends up with a thing that's just a mess and you can't experiment in it anymore because yeah. it isn't flexible enough for that. So I feel like you actually have some things there's that a you skill. do. There's, there's a layer on top of that that I see you do that, that does have to do with it, you know, like the property ID systems and those sorts of things. There are sorts of things that you've started to develop, I feel like, in the way that you build games that are designed to allow you to have that mindset in the small while not creating a disaster in the large. And I was wondering if you could maybe share some of that perspective. Um, well, what you do is first, you don't have this skill, and then you have a lot of disasters, right? And then <laughs> you see what the pattern was yes. of what happened, right? And, and you build it. And what it is is just, uh, you know, I'm going to write something messy. And um, first of all, when I do this, I'm visualizing what is the day when I'm going to swap this out for something better if I need okay. to, and how well is that going to go, and how is that swap out going to happen? Okay. And then, right, because there's a small number of people on the code base, at least at the team sizes I work at, you have to know that every time you go back and interact with that thing, and you constantly reality check it, right? So like at some point, if it starts to become a different thing than I thought, because, you know, one day we added this other way to query this system, and yeah. then that sort of became the main way because yeah. it grew out and became a bulbous apparition. Um, <laughs> at some point, you, then you have to inter interdict and say, no, okay, we don't any longer understand the situation, and maybe it is time to refactor this or, or something, right? But... Um, so would you say that if I was to sort of re restate that yeah. as a method, it's yeah. kind of like, okay, I'm writing this code, and even the first time that I write it, I kind of like play act in my head, what if this was really important? Like it turns out that this test thing that I'm doing here, this thing that I'm playing with on the design or whatever the code, yeah. if this were to become very crucial that it work quickly or do something or you know, that it's gonna have ramifications with save games or whatever, you're gonna kind of go through that in your head a little bit even during that first write, or only right after the first write? Like, where does that first thing happen? When you have enough experience, you can do the first pass at that like it's reflexive. So it just happens you kind just, of No, naturally. when you have the idea of what you're about to type, yeah. part of that idea is, uh, here's the life cycle of this thing I'm okay. about to type. Right? Right. And, um, and you just know, yeah, yeah. You, just, you, you have a feel of, how hairy is this thing, right? And, right? and those of us who've been around long enough to type a lot of things, most of what we type just doesn't even set off any alarm bell, right? Okay. I mean, almost everything that I'm gonna do, I just store some stuff in an array and I iterate over the array. <laughs> and like, I pull some <laughs> things out of the array, right? Yeah. Like, it's yeah. not, um, that part of programming is not, the, right? The, at, at some level of experience, the hard parts all come from complex, systems, yes. right? And interactions that were hard to predict when you sat down, right, initially. And so I would say the other part of what, what I'm not saying yet, or what I feel is lacking from what I've said yet, is that the other reason to keep those components simple is because that later part is the important part. And okay. you want to prep for that later part as, as well as you can. So if you prematurely optimize, for example, yeah. The problem with premature optimization is not only that you spent the time to optimize, okay. right? It is also that after you have optimized, you've produced a piece of code that is more brittle and has more connections to the yes. rest of the code, right? Yeah. So if you have some graph and each piece of code is like a circle in the graph, right? Yeah. There's some level of connectivity of what number of things talk to other things. And I don't, yeah. I don't even mean via function calls, but like, you know, this thing, um, you know, data is set up in a certain right. way, and this guy needs to know that, and this guy needs to know that, yeah. or something, right? Um, there are constraints that happen, and complexity, uh, the way I visualize it, and this may not be the best way, but it's the best way that I know of, complexity is just the number of arcs in that graph, right? Okay. So if you have n modules and n arcs, they're just all connected one by one, and it passes straight through, that's an ideal program from heaven okay. that does not exist in reality, but is very simple, right? Because we can just modify the front and back half of any piece yeah. of code, and the arc now can be whatever we want. Because, yeah, and the point is, let's draw this. Be my guy. You know, so this is, you know, this is like an amazing, simple piece of code, right? Now, the thing is, you know, if this is, 
I don't even know what this is like. This is some user interface, right? And this is like simulation. I, I, this is render. This program is so simple, there's almost no point putting these, because already this is wrong, because right, your UI cares about rendering. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but you know, what, what happens, a real program, right, is something more like this, where you got a bunch of things and just start drawing these all day, right, because these, these just go forever. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, complexity management of software is about reducing the number of arcs. Because actually the arcs are way harder to think of. In school, you usually, you know, you usually think about the circles because that's what they teach you to think about. Like, oh, this is an object and it has these yeah. policies and everything. Yeah. If everything could be inside this object, then that would be totally fine, but that's not reality, right? right. In fact, most of what you care about is actually in these arcs that I'm yes. now messing up by drawing arrows to. The arcs um, almost always determine things, even yeah. at the optimization stage, like performance. It's almost always about the arcs and not so much yeah. about what goes in, on in, in the circle. In academia, the arcs are called cross-cutting concerns, which makes them sound like just one little extra yeah. thing you should think yeah, about sometimes. Yeah. Actually, it's almost everything that you care about, okay. especially, and the more optimized your program right. is, the more of these that you have, right? Um, and even, so, you know, uh, the number of arcs that you can draw between n circles is O of n squared, yes. right? So a completely optimized program is O of n squared and gives you n squared more things to think about. Yeah. Whereas the perfect, beautiful program that doesn't exist is n, right? right? n squared is a lot bigger than n as n grows. Yes. So part of what's happening is keep n squared small. It's just like optimizing runtime, yeah. right? But you're optimizing how many things do I have to think about. However, right, I mean, I've said all this, you know, like optimizing code makes the code more complex and creates these problems, but we also have to optimize the code, right? Yeah. So um, there's in very intelligent trade-offs that have to be made about what deserves complexity and what does not. And you should be able to justify those by mapping them all the way, again, if we're talking about some lathe with extreme accuracy, yeah. by justifying it by mapping it all the way to that final shape that you're trying to cut. Okay. Like, okay, this piece of the curve is going to wobble a little bit if this thing isn't running at 60 frames because whatever, right? So in some sense, you might say that when you, in your head, like you're thinking about this system and you're like, what do we actually need to think about in terms of its complexity or how it's going to be designed or whatever, you're actually in your head thinking about the end state of that, the game itself and what its design needs. How critical is this thing? Can I, this doesn't erase. It should erase. There we yeah. go. Um, yes. Now, and of course, that's always just a heuristic, right? Because you're never, you, you're never I quite can't sure. see the future. And so would you say that that's true on, you know, that could stay. Well, I just, I just wanted to, if anyone like zips to the middle of the recording or something, I want them to at least have some idea of what the picture is. And that picture was completely dominated by this line. That, it's, like, it's perfect now. It's, yeah. it's totally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Self-explanatory, yeah. <laughs> Everything else, well, so really, I guess, let's see, 355, so really we can just take the next 30 minutes off because if everyone just looks at that diagram for long yeah. enough, they'll get the rest of it pretty much by, by osmosis, yeah. um, by diffusion. So, okay, taking that a little more concretely, so your structure at the outset when you're talking about something like this, right? I mean, I'm gonna explore, you know, it, I'm, I'm putting myself in, in your shoes here. Yeah. I have some design ideas that I've started out with, and we've already said that I have to iterate on these design ideas quite a bit potentially to get to, you know, depending on what the game is, to get to the final place where I'm actually comfortable that we, we got it. Like, it's like, okay, we got to the place I actually wanted to get to. So I have to do a bunch of iterations, and these iterations obviously are gonna first of all involve creating new nodes to this graph, right? I'm adding new pieces of code, and yeah. also obviously new arcs to the graph as those go, right? Yeah. So I guess what I would say is, I'm approaching each individual node that I add. I'm approaching each one of those as here is a piece of code that I'm going to try and write as simply as possible. And I'm not going to try and overcomplicate it. Just whatever gets the job done in this engine, right? 
But then there's a separate part, which is that all of the inputs into that, like whatever has, however it has to get the stuff that it needs, which in a game like, for example, The Witness is actually extremely complicated. There's so many things that it might be wanting to know about, uh, you know, as far as like what it needs to do to actually test this part of the design. What's your thought process like for keeping that, I, I want to say, superstructure in place, right? Because that's sort of the policy or like the, the services that are servicing the arcs between these things. Like, you know, there's a bunch of things like the thing I mentioned the other day to you, which is like it's pretty impressive that over the entire development of The Witness, you could almost always still load a save game, right? Like, tell me a little bit about that well, sort of background of how that works, and are there things in particular that you've learned over the years that are like, Having systems work this way tends to make it much easier for me to do the small pieces in a way that doesn't start screwing with the whole system. Right? Well, the, you know, the reason, the reason we can load a save game specifically, so I'm not sure that I understand really the question at a general level, so we might okay. have to iterate for a little bit, but the save game thing That's specifically, right, of, of the... um, that is just the same system that I had in Braid, which I had, had arrived um, just through experience, right? Okay. Like, you need to serialize your stuff, you need that to be robust and good and pretty fast, and you need it to be flexible, right? Um, although I don't get carried away with flexibility, so for, we actually just had this conversation in the office the other day. Um, we are not forward compatible, right? Okay. So you have an old execute, or if you have a new execute, uh, an old executable in a new save game, right. we crash right now okay. loading that, which is fine, but we want to do something about that for release probably because okay. you never know what's going to happen gonna out happen in here. the wild. I mean, on a console, it's probably fine, but on PC. Um, but again, that's relatively easy to add, right? But the main concern is, is backward, right? Like, you want people, you know, we push, yeah. we push updates on Steam all the time and to the greatest extent possible, we want people to just get the update and play, right? Yeah. And with whatever save game and, that's worked ever since our first build went on Steam, which is several years at this point. Yeah. Um, the, the main thing that breaks it is content, right? Like we push yeah. content that. Right, you change where you were, and the player has to be standing it's, on the thing that you moved or yeah, something. That's obviously yeah. not going to work. But I mean, in general, if yeah. the game could be playable, it usually was, was yeah. my experience. Um, so, but that was just, again, you know, having enough problems and having to solve them seriously enough. But at some point, you just arrive at an opinion of what's the best way to program. It's the same reason I don't use Lisp now, right? Okay. Or Scheme, right? So what I, one of the things I was taught in college was how cool Scheme is. Okay. For all these reasons that now I do not care about. Okay. Because I, I have evaluated them in the context of the wider world and discovered that I don't care that I can use a redevelop print loop. Okay. Because that's a very primitive thing that almost never gives me useful information, right? Okay. Um, or I don't care that the syntax is all parentheses and that that's beautiful from some okay. thing, right? Um, so in that same way, uh, you know, there's, there's just problems that you have when making a game, and one of them is serializing and, and whatever, right? And once you hammer down those problems so well that, like, there may still be issues, but they're epsilon compared to all these other issues that you have. You just consider that solved, and you don't need to worry about it unless you someday come up with a design that challenges those assumptions. assumptions okay. But I think the more experienced we get, the more that that happens. So when I started in games, nobody knew what a quaternion was. Right. right? It was a while before we right. yeah. saw that, and then, and then there were debates about yeah. whether that was the right way to do things, yep. right? And now, usually people, like a, the quaternion is, I think, now this default thing. Yeah. There's reasons why you don't want to use one for s specific cases, but in general, it's solved, yes. right? So serialization, I feel like, is mostly solved, apart from issues of how the hell you interface with the programming language and stuff, because right, right, C++ yeah. is terrible for it's it. Very terrible. So you have to make a decision like, do I um, do, I do something where I preprocess header files, right, and pull the data and then do that, or do I just force you to do extra work every time you declare a thing? I went for option B, force you to do extra work, um, because I had terrible experiences with option A when I was a contractor okay. in the wider world. Like, gotcha. I, I did a summer at Sun Microsystems messing around, and like their, their GUI thing was, um, I'm forgetting the name now, but 
the sun. Uh, they use it'll like a version of, of it'll. Oh, okay. IDL. So like a preprocessor so like that you goes would through. you would generate a thing and it would okay. it, it was an annoying build step and then you'd get a header file full of integer IDs that would change every time. Okay. Right. Yep. So that was they didn't even solve that serialization. Main right. Problem. Okay. It just it was annoying and um, I like um, I like knowing what's happening and I like keeping the core of stuff simple and okay. just my experiences with that were bad enough. I, yeah. That you decided not, to, that you wanted it to be more manual just because of that. Yeah, I also had some bad experiences with some, uh, there's like this language in Formix 4GL, I don't know if anyone in the audience okay. knows what this is, but it was like a language that people would paste on top of SQL okay. to like try to add value, okay. and in reality it would like just pre-process down to SQL commands that okay. were not really checked in the right way, so okay. but then you get an SQL error and you have to like map it to your source code. Okay. Like, so genetically in me, I, I hate that stuff because okay. I've had so many problems. So you want something so, direct. Yeah. It is too much detail and something that doesn't warrant that much detail, but... Uh, well, I actually, so I have a follow-up on that then, yeah. though, even from that, which is that, so in general, would you say that you start out with certain ad hoc code for these things. Like, I'm going to write down and write the simplest possible thing. Certain core systems stay around long enough through multiple projects that it's just like they get refined to a point where now they're no longer kind of a question in this, like in your node graph, for example, where it's just we bake those down to like we can rely on this is how this should probably go, and everyone else can just assume that that's the way that's going to go, kind of a thing. And you've gotten yeah. to that point now on it, or is it, is it like no, it's totally are those that. systems are those systems sort of in some sense conceptually a little different now because they've gotten to a certain point of maturity, or is it still always kind of the same attitude where it's like no, it's just another piece and well, you know. I, so in this particular case of the witness, um, it was not even a question. For example, again with entity state because. I went from a game with a relatively challenging problem statement around entity state, right? Okay. It was about rewinding time and right. having it be perfect and being able yeah. to go forward and backward in time. So, um, you know, that's a very robust serialization, deserialization system. To go from that to what games more typically want to do, which is just like, I've got a level with some stuff. Of course, it's an open world level. Yeah. So that was the ambitious part. We have about um, 70,000 entities in our yeah. world, which is big for an indie game. Yeah. It's not really big for a AAA game. Yeah. Uh, but those are all live at once, so they, you know, um, 70,000 live entities. But that's not, um, 70,000 is not a scary number for a modern computer, right? right? As long as you do something that is roughly constant per thing, you're fine yeah. at, at that level, yeah. unless you're the Windows file system and you put 70,000 files in one folder. <laughs> 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 Which we then had to do terrible things to work around. Uh, yeah, uh, well, there's a directory per, per there's, We have 100 a, subfolders. Yeah, so he is not making this up. This is actually a thing that actually happened. So on the every, every entity has a numerical ID, right? These days they're about six digits. And, uh, oh, let, let, let me tell this whole story because this is amusing, yeah. right? You think, like, oh my God, how do you do multi user collaboration? It's such a hard problem because we're building this open world environment, right? And, uh, everybody's editing the world at once. You can't really lock part of the world. Just people do, everybody changes things, right? And like, how do you sync that? That's like a really wicked problem. And, and well, the way you sync it is all your entities are very easy to read text files. And everyone's a separate file. And you just check it into Subversion. And it yes. works fine. And you don't, you don't do the one or two things that will break that. Like, the w one thing that'll break it is, um, you know, like you have a group. I have a group of entities. And people are adding and removing things from that group all the time. Yeah. And you could make a source control system that understood the semantics of, oh, the order of things in this array don't matter. Don't matter. But right. in, in reality, it, eh. yeah. so instead, when we store things in groups, you have my entity stores the group I'm in, and then right. we reconstitute that array at load time. And I see. That's very fast, right? But anyway, so every entity is a text file, so we have 70,000 text files. Right. And Ignacio just needed to speed it up, so he was like, well, what if we make 100 subfolders? by the last two digits of the entity ID, and then that's where you go to find What it. was the slow part? So, uh, you know, you, you sort of approached this problem in very much exactly the way that you're saying, which yeah. is that, like, you just said, what's the simplest thing that would possibly work? Yeah. If we want to edit a whole world, it's built out of entities, let's just make a different file for every entity, and, that's and we'll exactly let the source what we code did. control resolve the conflicts, because we know that it can merge text files. Yeah. Right? 
Yeah, and so and then we ran into and, and the simplest version of yeah. the system was like the simplest version of what you just said. Yeah. And then we ran into problems with the group thing and like one or two yeah. other things. Um, and then it started getting slow once there was yeah. a lot of content, right? And what got slow? Was it subversion? Just Windows barfs when you get over a certain number of files in a folder. What happened? Just it's get, around eleven thousand. When you get more than you can't 000. like open in them or something. Like what happened? I don't know. I don't know how the file system <laughs> is set up. So. Um, but I mean, what did you see happening? Well, it's not a um, it's not a UI level thing because okay. um, even when we would boot right to start to read the files. Uh, you know, we use uh, what's the frickin' API, right? The, oh, um, so like if you're doing create file or something like that. No, no, no. Um, um, yeah, the find first file, find next file, right? Okay. That starts taking a really long time. Okay, so just iterating over the files in the directory, Windows was like, at 11,000, that's too many it files. It just starts going off. Nobody should have that many files in a directory, no. so we're just not going to. Yeah. Okay. All right, so then you had to break it up into separate directories and then iterate the directories. So you're basically just creating your own tree, <laughs> which is what NT in theory should have probably been doing, but yes, okay. Yeah. All right, uh, so that's actually worked remarkably well too. I guess I hadn't thought about that, but uh, the fact that you can open world edit the witness and everyone can edit at the same time, they can edit no, the same insane. regions. it's insane, it's insane. And it's just a bunch of text files, yeah. yeah. Well. In case anyone was wondering whether the attitude of do the simplest thing works, that's a pretty good example. Yeah, I should have thought of that, but yeah. I'm glad we came upon it. I mean, there's, that's not the only thing. There's a bunch of things like that. Um, like, the only reason that we are able to make a game, it's, so the game's taken us a long time to make, but it is a really big, really complicated game. There's, yes, like, sir. a lot of stuff in it, and we're a very small team. Yeah. We're, we've got testers now, so I think we have eight people, including testers. Uh, so very small. Oswin. Oh, and the dog. And the dog. Yes, yeah, so nine, yeah. team of nine. One of them only eats cupcakes and never gets anything yeah. done. Um, Bad hire. Yeah. <laughs> but good for morale. So, you know, you have to, um, like, being able to build systems to let you make a game is a luxury, right? Yeah. Um, sort of. It's necessary to a point, and then it's a luxury. And we straddle that line all the time. And, you know, I'm not always going to claim in the best way. You just have to allocate your effort, right? Just like with anything, right? So there's something stupid in the game right now that we just have never fixed, right? Uh, we do, we're very focused on iteration. People have talked about how iteration is important, and we do that. You know, you can, the game will just like hot load textures and all that, so you just change the texture in Photoshop, you see it on the screen. Um, our editor and the game are the same program, so you just hit F11, you're in the editor, which is a separate copy of the world where you move stuff around, you hit save, you press F11 again, and all the stuff is moved, right? There's like literally zero iteration time apart from inconveniences involved in how long it takes to start up, which is like, Probably 45 seconds or something. It's That's more just this side of tolerable. Yeah. 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 Um, but you know, there's things that are kind of terrible. So, for example, if you're working on an animated entity with a lot of bones and you change it a lot, the game kind of crashes sometimes <laughs> because it hot loaded something with like a different number of bones and didn't match something. And it that didn't. Person. Something okay. didn't get cleared, and it probably would take a day or less to fix. But we've just got too much to do, and we don't edit animated things that enough, much. So it's just like, so it's just like sorry, your game's going to crash today, yeah. and we just bear it, right? So there's there's always trade-offs there. So uh, I guess one thing that I kind of wanted to to get at with the the sort of the iterative model of of how you're developing things and and the systems and that sort of stuff is just uh, I guess if you are if you're working with other people who aren't necessarily iterating on the design, right? Because you've got programmers who are working on doing stuff like making sure the rendering works and that sort of stuff. How do you sort of manage that part of the process where you're trying to iterate on design stuff and other people are trying to build these other systems and you're kind of running them in parallel? Because you've had now multiple years where actually you have been adding stuff to the design. Like the design did not stop three years ago and then people have just been programming or something. You still add stuff. We for the added most part, some or? stuff. Two weeks ago? Yeah. <laughs> um, so having yeah. that, like, like, can you talk a little bit about, is there anything in particular to say about this concept of like, okay, how do we make sure that these other people who are trying to do their job of making like the rendering fast or something, and I'm still trying to like change maybe how some of these puzzles work a little bit and I'm implementing some slightly new things uh, code-wise in there, how does that 
how does that work out? Do you have well, to like have a lot of interaction, or do you try to structure it in the code so that they don't? You have what? to have a lot of interaction in the beginning okay. so that everybody understands what the hell we're doing, okay. right? And that's much easier to do with people who are actually on the team as full-time people. Um, it's much harder. Uh, you know, we're talking about this in the context of programming, but there yeah. are other things that have functional effects on the design. Yeah. For example, we're working with architects who right. Professional architects who design buildings and like the, they'll design some buildings for the game, but what they design is what you play, and right. they don't understand game design, so there right. have to be some very complicated conversations there, right? Um, and then because they don't work for you, they're gone, and all that effort was wasted at some point. Okay. It's a very um, high effort to result ratio, whereas someone who's a programmer on the team, it's a much lower effort to result ratio because they're sticking around, hopefully for at least a while, and they get it, right? Um, and then also on my side, because I understand programming generally, yes. I don't even know what decision Ignacio made on the renderer this week, right? right. But I know how renderers work. Okay. So like I know preemptively if I'm gonna do something that is probably maybe gonna be slow, and then we can have that conversation. Knowing that you may need to have a conversation is much better than just like, I did something and it breaks. Is my audio dropping out? It keeps, I, all right. I think it's okay. It's a little echoey. My ears are dropping out. I'm getting old. Uh, well, one thing, so, so I guess uh, along those lines, would you say that it's important for somebody who's going to design a very ambitious game like The Witness or something like that, yeah. would you say that the, the programmer designer who's doing that sort of lead work that you're doing there, is it kind of important for them to have an understanding of all of those systems then in some sense? Meaning the fact that you've worked on all of those yourself in the past, right? Yeah. Uh, has that been critical? Meaning, do you think that it would have been, you know, <clears throat> you know, significantly worse if you didn't know how a render worked? Uh, would that have posed really difficult challenges for you? Yes, at many levels. So okay. it would have made the game a lot harder to make. Okay. Right. Um, so again, similarly to Mike's comment, like you should go read the manual for the CPU you're using. Yeah. Like, the engine is the manual for the design that you're shipping. Okay. Right? Because how is that design ever going to happen if the engine doesn't make right. it? Right. It can happen? only do what the engine can and do. And we're bordering on spoilers, right? But okay. And we won't go purely into spoiler territory, but like a third of the design of the witness just would, the ideas wouldn't have happened if I didn't know how to program 3D graphics, right? Okay. Like if I didn't know okay. how yep. RGB color works right. and yeah. specularity and whatever, right? right? right. Like that. Yes. So. That's a, all right. <laughs> we, we would have had a much worse game, right? And actually, the same thing happened on Braid. On Braid, it's like the first, like, really interesting thing in the design is how you have some entities in the world that don't get rewound anymore, right? right. They sparkle green, and you rewind some things, and it takes them out of sync with other things. Yeah. And the origin of that idea was just because I was making the rewind. And that function, like I said, everything is iterate over an array and do stuff, yeah. right? And this function was iterate over this array and look up the old state of this entity from this other heap and copy this fields. Yeah. And you're just looking at that and you're just like, oh, I could skip some things. Yeah. That's the, the whole game design right there. <laughs> right. It's like, I could skip some things in this array. Yeah. yeah. And there you go. Yeah. And that's a, that's a programmer idea. It's not really, I mean, a designer could come to that same thing, but it would be a, by a very different route, and yeah. I don't know if I would have come to it by that route. And I suppose some of the things, too, where you're like, uh, the example of the world where your x coordinate in the world equals time, it's kind of a very natural thing that you might arrive at as a programmer, which would be much harder if you're just kind of sitting back there thinking about it abstractly. You may never get yeah, if you Yeah, if you come at game design like, I want to make a metaphor for, yeah time being tied to my emotional state yeah. or something. You yeah. end up with something that sucks, right? Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's usually what happens. Okay. And I'm not, yeah. I mean, games that are designed that way, you can feel it when they're okay. designed that way, right? Okay. You, you get something different. Yeah. I'm not trying to say that you can't design games that way. You can. You just have to put a great deal of effort into solving the problems. There's different problems, right? It's like when you make a program that's an equation versus a program that's if statements. Okay. It's very different in nature. Yeah. If statements kind of suck, yeah. but you can make some very good things with them. Yeah. You just have to put in a lot of work to make sure there's continuity between all the cases and yeah. whatever, right? It's like that. 
So I think we are running. I'm very talkative. I feel like no, I actually, haven't said yeah, a damn we've got, thing. We've got, I think we've got. Uh, we, I think we got about twenty more minutes. Let's right. see on the clock. So we have. Right. We have. We can go through, through a couple more things there. Let's do it. So uh, that's actually kind of. I'm going to ask a question about that, even though this was totally not something that I had thought of asking at all before. But that's kind of an interesting metaphor. So you're talking when you said the the if statement versus the uh, the equation there. So you're literally talking about the fact, like, well, if I have a single equation, I know that this thing is continuous. And you're saying, if I'm making a bunch of if statements to sort of model something that I expect to be continuous, I have to make sure that each of these cases, when you would be transition from one to the other, you will line up exactly with yes. there. Yes, yes. So why, why did you reach for that? Like, like, why did you go with that analogy just then? I was a little thrown by it. What was I talking about You were talking that? about the design <laughs> of something being not programmer oriented, right? Uh, oh, because, um, so the, the, the way that I do design, and I think that, there's a small school of game design. There's a number of people who do things this way, a small number, small number. Right, that I know of. Okay. Um, and it's about, you know, we're building a system. It's a, the software yeah. is a system that has some dynamics. Yes. And you're exploring what the dynamics are of those systems. Yeah. And I'm going to try to turn some way that minimizes feedback. And so <laughs> you, can, uh, you can pilot where you're going in terms of that exploration, but fundamentally you're exploring things that are there. Okay. Right? Versus... I'm telling the computer what to do. Okay. And in this moment, um, you know, the princess steals a car and drives, of course to, she does. <laughs> drives to somewhere and something. I don't know. Okay. It, the, the point of that, just a totally arbitrary idea that you then need to force the computer to do. It's okay. a different, it's going in different directions. Right? Okay. Daniel Ben Bergree calls this top down versus bottom up, but I don't. Say that because I think top down versus bottom up is very overloaded in a lot of different Other ways. ways of thinking about sure. different things, yeah. right? But it's similar. If you want to think about it as top down versus bottom up, you can. And I do. I don't do just bottom up, right? I do bi-directional. Yeah. yeah. But there's a whole lot of bottom up. And if you start fighting what starts coming bottom up, you get something that sucks. So basically. When you come at something from a top-down perspective, when you come at something, not yeah. one of the people who strictly does that, yeah. you're sort of looking at that as more, I'm coming at it from a top-down perspective, and to make that a little more concrete for people who maybe aren't thinking about it, that would be like, I have this idea for this exact thing the player might do in The Witness, versus here are some rules in The Witness that might create puzzles. That would be like top-down versus bottom-up might be a reasonable way to say that. Or do you, want to, do you want to have a more specific way? Well, the rules had to come from somewhere. Yeah. And that's really the bottom up is where they come from. Okay, so, so even lower than that. Yeah, like, okay, you know, I've got this line that I could draw. Yeah. And um, what, like, what are the properties of that? It's, you would think there's almost none, but there actually are some, right? Is there, do you limit the length of it? Is, right. that, is that a dynamic, right? Right. Um, is it, uh, can it cross itself, right. right? And those, at first blush, sound like arbitrary rules, but they come from a certain investigation of what are the parameters at play in this very constrained idea space. And if I'm going to be highly competent about exploring this small space, what do I do with those parameters, right? Versus, like, a top-down thing would be like, um, you know, when I draw the line, the alien spacecraft Comes shoots down. its heat ray in that direction, yeah. and then I can burn a tree, and right. because that tree is burning, I'll be able to read the book that's baked into concrete next to the tree, <laughs> or something, right? Um, it's an Infocom game. Yeah. <laughs> Infocom wasn't the worst at no. that. Uh, I so, won't, we all know who was so, the worst. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I meant to say it's a CR game. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So uh, I guess then I can go back with that in mind and ask the question I was going to ask before, which is, so you're sort of saying that the top-down approach, when you do employ it, is more about giving you some more ideas about what to investigate to create the bottom-up things in some sense, right? So like I come at it and I say like, oh, I wanted to do the thing where the alien spaceship shoots the burning tree and lights up the book because I feel like that will tell me, like that will generate more sort of like systemic rules that I can then use to create. The, the problem with that example is it's too systemic because light actually shines on the book. Yeah, right, yeah. Right, you would need something where like, well, there really. was a prophecy about the burning tree yeah. and then the old man comes running out of 
the hut. <laughs> okay. And, okay. and then you steal his cane because you needed the cane to prop open the door. Exactly. That's the new example. Okay. Because there's nothing systemic there at all. I'm not going to remember that. But, well, for... <laughs> it's on record. But for my... <laughs> I need to remember it right now. We can't review the record when I'm going to ask questions. For the original example, though, the light is the example of the bottom-up thing coming from the top down. And so, so if mm, you were going to yeah. do it right, yeah. you're coming in at top down and you're saying, oh, like, this is a situation I'm going to explore. What would be the bot? Like, what are the systems I have to program to make this actually occur? And then you get to the part of like, oh, maybe light shining to illuminate things is part of my game rule set. Yeah. Is that more of a way? That, sort of that would make sense, that cycle right? In some sense? And then you have to decide how important of a part is it. Yeah. And you reassess that from time to time. Is my game really about this or not? Okay. You know, um, am I? Is is my game design like an amoeba, kind of absorbing this idea and in growing to support it? Yeah. That's a good thing to do to an extent, but yeah. then at some point. You've got too many things, right? Yeah, um, yeah the, the th other thing I was going to say is the top down also, so it does two things. One is it gives you a starting point, right? You have yes. to start somewhere. Yes. And you could start purely bottom up, but I have never done that. OK. Um, so purely bottom up, as an example, would be you're literally just sort of starting to make, like a physics sandbox would be an example of a bottom up thing. Where I'm just, just going to start making some simulations, and I don't really have an idea what it does. But even that, like. Or is that not? You had the idea to explore a physics sandbox, right? Okay. Bo real bottom up would have to be like I was working at some other job someday and my program did something and I quit that job because I thought that was interesting and followed okay. it, right? Okay. Like pure bottom up is very, very hard to find. Okay. I literally um, had no conception of what was going to happen. It just happened. Yeah. All right. Um, but, but so then the other thing is top down guides you because you're trying to go somewhere that has some human interest to it. Um, if you purely, uh, there's a paradox, right? Because you have to be very interested in systems and what happens with systems. And, you know, you have to be able to observe and take joy in what's happening with your system and then make your design be able to show that to people and take joy in it and communicate that. At the same time, if you find every system interesting, that's going to be really boring to almost everybody in the world, right? OK, because um, you have to have some sort of a criteria for what makes a system generally interesting yeah. to someone who's not a sy systems programmer. <laughs> or something. I, I don't know, right? Uh, but again, that's also, if you put too much of that in, that's what makes the game bad. Okay. So okay. it's a fine, it's a little pinch of salt. So uh, I guess, uh, let's see how much time we've got now. Yeah, OK, so we're, we're, ju we're just about to wrap up, I guess. So would you say, in general, like when you sit down to do design work on a game, quote unquote, is that really something, is that really the way you think about it in your head? Or is it more just like I sit down to work on the game, and whether I'm programming or designing in quotes or whatever are not really separated activities? Or do you feel like there's definite, like here are n modes that I'm in, and I switch between those modes? Like, What's the kind of like mental model that you have? Because since you are doing lots of different activities, um, and like, like the yeah. other day I saw you take a walk, you're like, I'm going to take a walk because I have to think about some game stuff, yeah. right? So yeah. what is that mental state? For me, there are n modes. And they're not, um, again, there's no very solid barrier Certainly. between them, but there's a continuum. And so programming is toward one end of the spectrum once you're experienced, right, which is, when you're experienced and you want to make a game happen, again, you, you know how to type a reasonable approximation to the answer to almost any problem that you're really going to have. Okay. You don't have to sit down and figure out the architecture of how I'm going to, I don't know, let's take some, like how, I'm, how am I going to do collision detection in this game, at least to a first approximation. Right. You don't need to spend a week. It's like, I don't really care. Like if I was writing it from scratch, it would just be like, okay, top level, there's going to be a, or grid or something, right. right? And then you do a query for who's nearby, and then you do some kind of triangle to triangle, right. and maybe later you insert more accelerants into yeah. there, whatever. Yeah. It's not, who cares? I can write something, it'll work until it needs modification, right? And that's mostly the experience talking there, where it's like, yeah. I know what these systems generally look like, so I know I can just sort of yeah. fudge one in temporarily. And, and that is. 99.9% .9 of programming time at okay. some point. Okay. Um, and part of that is, again, because our languages and tools are not that good. If with really good languages and tools, we could maybe knock 
a half a nine. So we could get it down to 99.5. Right, is that your goal with JAI? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, OK. But uh, you half know, nine, we, JAI has half, ha half nine capabilities. Nine. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, um, that's just the thing. Like experienced programmers can make stuff happen. And then even, you know, even if you're optimizing, you're not working most of the time. So it's a two-step thing. See what's happening. Yep. And then usually what's happening these days is like I'm missing the cache all the time. Yeah. And you just know how to approach that. Okay. So maybe the details of how you approach it vary a little bit. But you don't, you don't have to, I don't know. The more of a series of an optimization it is, then the more you have to go figure it out, right? Yeah. So that's why there's a continuum, right? Yeah. Now on the design side, I don't want to be doing that as design, right? I don't want to make a MOBA that's just like Dota 2, but um, you know, I don't like the way Razor's thing goes out and then comes right back in. I want it to stay out for a while. It's Whatever. a very ambitious design. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, which is just to say that in design, if you're, the reason we repeat ourselves conceptually in programming is because we have to, because code reuse is not really as much of a thing as we wish it was. If code okay. reuse actually worked the way it was supposed to, we would always be solving bigger and ever bigger, more ambitious problems, and right. our knowledge from the past would not apply so well. Right. Instead, it applies tremendously well. Right, right? Right. With design, um, I, I try to make things at least that are new, and that my understanding of a designer does not kick out an answer to everything immediately. Yeah. Um, if it does, it bothers me, and it makes me think, like, oh, I'm not working that hard on it. So it's this. kind of very different from the programming yeah. side. And so you what has to yeah. happen, right, is the magical thing where you're in a shower, or in bed, you wake up the next day and you just have the idea. The magical shower. Yes, you're in the magical shower that sprinkles. Yeah. Um, no, or, or just, you know, or I've been designing for a while and I'm stuck on something and I go program for two weeks and then I come back and I know the answer, right? So there's, okay. there's this very subconscious processing if you're gonna take that model of things. I don't, if you look at, ideas of what the brain is all through history. It's always analogous to the most technologically sophisticated thing of the time. Oh, really? So okay. now it's like the brain's a computer. Right. In the early 1900s, it was the brain is like a very complicated telephone switchboard. Oh, really? Right? Okay. Yeah, and then you can trace yeah. back. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but to take that analogy, right, that is much more important for me in design than it is in programming, simply because I don't need it in programming almost ever. Okay. If I needed it, then I'd probably go take a walk to okay. figure out how I'm going to make this line not intersect itself. But so, that's okay, just stupid, right? Right, right, like, right, right. Yeah. OK, so I mean, it sort of sounds like what you're saying there is that like, the mindset's almost completely different, it sort of sounds like, with approaching well, the programming it, problems it, it, and approaching it, the design problems to some degree. But with the design thing, there's, you know, so OK, this high level idea has just appeared to me out, yes. of, out of this. A new high-level idea has appeared in the basement. Yes, exactly. Um, and then for this particular game, for example, in The Witness, there's a lot of instances of puzzles, right? Yeah. Sometimes I'm just messing around with an idea to see what happens to find bottom-up things. Yeah. And like, oh, this kind of makes an interesting puzzle. Let me, the, the top-down thing says, oh, that looks interesting. OK. And then let's drive it bottom-up a little more. Sometimes it's like, Sometimes I really do get a little more top down because I feel like we're trying to build a thing that touches all these points in this idea space. This one is missing or it doesn't have very many things. Okay. We need to fill that. Okay. And that's a very unhappy time because okay. it means I have to be a lot like a computer okay. and I have to start iterating on different, like, okay, I want this particular idea in the game. It has to be in the game. Okay. That puzzle doesn't do it. That puzzle doesn't do it. Oh, this does. And then I wake up in the next morning without the preconceptions of how to solve it, and I solve it trivially a different way that breaks the puzzle, and I'm like, damn it, okay. right? And so there is a very, um, a very much more iterative, I'm just trying a bunch of stuff okay. mode, which is not the same as the bottom-up design mode, but it's a different bottom-up. This is why I don't like to say top-down, bottom-up. Well, it, it, it is a top to me down, like you mode. have the space, and you've got a number of different sort of things that you're talking about there, but it's like, 
you have a particular point in the space that you're driving towards. And that, so, so yeah. as opposed to just a more free exploration where I'm just going like, oh, I'm seeing what sort of happens as I try these different things out. Here it's like I'm actually evaluating each one by a different metric, not the general game metric of is this good uh, for my stated goals, more just like am I getting closer to point X? Like do I think this is kind of getting in that, or and eventually I kind of get in there and say, yes, I finally found the puzzle that satisfies these criteria that you know, it has to sort of fit in this, in yeah. this area. Totally. So let's see, do we have, uh, what do we have? Nope, we are, we are out of time. We are officially out of time, I believe. We so, hardly got to any of your questions, so. No, we got to tons of my questions. All right. I mean, uh, the, the thing I had to skip was JAI questions, basically, but okay. I feel like that is something that we could easily handle the next Handmade Con after right. JAI is used throughout all of industry. <laughs> um, if it's happening next year, that may be a little early for no, that. No, I, I feel like it'll be government certified somewhere around the summer after you kind of get it out there, right. and then it'll be space shuttles and, and so on. <laughs> no problem. All right. Um, but so, uh, as a final closing one, so I, I guess uh, I can't really ask the question that I was asking, which is what have you, the, other, the other people, which is what are you working on at the moment, because I think everyone kind of knows. So I'll just say, how are you doing? <laughs> how are you holding up? You, you doing okay? Because this must be a very stressful time. Um, I'm actually pretty happy right now. I okay. mean, it's one of those things where the worst that could happen is we miss our ship date by okay. a little bit, which is not great, then but all that means is a lot of gamers on the internet feeling entitled to tell me I'm a <laughs> terrible developer because I obviously, yeah. you know, um, I don't think we will. I think we'll be on time, but um, it depends. Um, but it's a very, uh, on a small team, right, you have to make everything happen. Yeah. And there's a bell curve of how much you think has to happen, and it's heavily weighted toward the right. So the to-do lists get longer and longer and longer and longer and longer and longer and longer yeah. for a really long time, yeah. again, because all these problems are fractal and you keep getting new things. Yeah. And at some point, like you re remember, like maybe two years ago, two and a half years ago, I was in a really bad mood all the time. Yes. Because it was near the top of that curve okay. and there was like no end in sight, right? Okay. It's like I can't even see I mean, obviously, the game's more done than ever before, but like yeah. the, there's just too much to do, and my yeah. brain can't understand yeah. all the things there are to do. And now it's like, okay, there's a lot of things to do in a short period of time, and I wish we had more time, and, um, but that's a very finite, tractable kind of... You can kind of get the whole you just, of it, just, yeah. You know, I just, like, like we just... Were, Casey came down to San Francisco, actually. He worked on the collision system for The Witness, and he flew down for about a week, and we just cranked, I don't know how many hour days, we pulled 14 hour days or something, I, approximately. I do not remember. Yeah, um, <laughs> for a week, and like you just do that and problems go away, right? And <laughs> no, but I mean that sounds funny, but that doesn't work in the middle of development. No, it doesn't, yeah. That adds problems in the middle, right? You, you work a 14 hour day and now your to-do list is 10% longer than it was at the beginning of the day. And that's the demoralizing part. So okay. now I'm actually, is, I'm a good dude. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for talking with us. Thanks, John. It's been a pleasure.